week we finished up chapter 4 in 1 Peter. Chapter 4 says, If the righteous, those who do the right thing and listen to God's voice, hear His voice and obey it, if those folks are just scarcely going to make it to heaven, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? They're going to appear the same place we are. In the face of God. The people who are in hell right now, that's a holding cell. We talked about that for nine weeks. When Jesus went to the lower parts, there's two holding cells at the time of Jesus. One for the righteous, those who believed in God, those who followed Jehovah, those who wanted his will, those who sought after righteousness, the Jobs of the world, and those who didn't. The rich man in hell lifted up his eyes being in torment, seeing Lazarus the bum far off because he believed in God. The bum did. But Lazarus didn't need God because he lived in America. Or, or, or the rich man didn't need God because he lived in America. That was his mentality. He had everything he needed. He didn't need God. And the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes being in torment and he saw Lazarus far off in Abraham's bosom. And those people in the hell side even today, when Jesus took all the people from the heaven side, paradise, when he took all them at the resurrection to heaven, because nobody could ever go to heaven before Jesus laid down his blood on the altar up there, the Ark of the Covenant. And when God was appeased at the offering of Jesus pouring out his blood on that, he was the final sacrifice for all men. That's why we don't need a temple and sacrifices anymore. Seventh day at Venice, Jehovah's Witness, listen up! You have no temple to do these things in anyway. Jesus saw to it in AD 70 that that thing was destroyed. He gave you 40 years to quit doing it on your own, and you didn't. You kept running back to your religious old ways, that place, that building, the church house. Jesus says, you're the church house. Don't be, don't be considered a building, your church house. It's a place to keep the rain off your head and a place for us to meet, but that ain't, the, that ain't the house of God. You are the house of God. Everything we have belongs to God. My house at home is the house of God. My car is the car of God. Yours is too. If we are God's, we've given him everything that is his because it's not ours. I have nothing. Everything that I have is on loan from God. It's all his. It's all from him. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job understood that. And when Jesus ascended to heaven and poured his blood out on the altar, God was appeased, the Father was appeased, and Jesus became the first fruits of all those who would resurrect. And hell had the larger borders when he took everybody from the paradise side, the heaven side. He took them to heaven finally in the presence of God, what we now consider heaven. And boom, those borders come flying down, and hell had the larger borders. And those people all in hell right now have the same degree of heat. It's a holding cell, like going down the county awaiting for your sentencing. Their bad day hadn't even happened yet. Their bad day is sentencing day when they have to come up and stand before God. That's going to be the roughest hell they've ever had. Because they're going to face the God that they didn't need in life, and he's going to look at them and say, you needed me, didn't you? And they're going to have to confess, yes, I needed you. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord on that day and they'll still go to hell, the eternal lake of fire. That's why we encourage you to get your heart right on this side. We're going to face the same judge. When we face him, it's going to be a time of glory. It's a time of goodness, time of awards, rewards, time of blessing. Our judgment for this Christian is not a bad thing. It's a blessed thing. It's an awesome thing. Now, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men to live righteously because you're going to face that judge. You might as well be holy. You might as well obey the word. You might as well walk in that word. You might as well be faithful and fruitful along the way. Might as well be a hundredfold. Why be thirtyfold when you can be a hundredfold? Because you're going to face that judge with whatever you brought forth. And so we live holy. We live righteously. We live humbly before him. And we're going to love seeing him face to face. Everybody in hell is going to hate seeing him face to face. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? They shall all appear before the great white throne of God and face him before he cast them into their eternal existence of a hotter hell based on all of their evil works that they did. 
That's what we looked at last week. This week, we're dealing with the church leaders. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Peter was a church leader. He was an elder, and he's talking to the elders. He's talking to everybody who's a church leader. God talks about church government. There's a very important thing that takes place in church government. In Acts chapter 6, Peter and all the guys who were full-time ministry were doing way too much. They were serving tables. They were helping widows out. And they were supposed to devote themselves to prayer fasting, and the word. That's what an elder does, a bishop, a pastor. These are all the same words. An overseer. When you see those words in scripture, it's the same person. It's the leader of the pack, the leader of the church, the one God assigned to lead. He's the overseer, the pastor, the bishop. And these people come along and they name themselves these things and they're none of those things. I'm an evangelist, whatever, Billy Bob, whatever my name is. I'm Apostle Ebenezer Johnson. And the First Lady, check her out. How stupid, how satanic, how worldly, how outside the Bible is that? So we have inside the Bible, and what did we see inside the Bible? We saw inside the Bible that there were widows that needed help. They still need help today. We saw inside the Bible there were tables that needed to be served. There were hungry folks that needed to be helped. And the people who had plenty were sharing it with those who didn't. But the pastors didn't have time to do it all. It was time for everybody to do a little bit. So they called forth these special people called diakonos or servants. Deacons we refer to them as in the English. And they said we need some holy men of God who have the heart of servants. Who don't have the hearts of Kings who want to be served, and they don't want prestige. They're lowly, holy men who just want to serve God by serving God's body, his people. And so they called forth these deacons, these diakonos, and that has changed in the church today. Instead of the diakonos, the servant, being the servant, they now want to take the place of leadership in the church and run the church. You're not supposed to run the church. That God has called the shepherd to do that, the under-shepherd, the overseer, the bishop, the pastor to do that. And that's why it's important for you to be sensitive to God and know what a good pastor, a good shepherd, a good under-shepherd looks like. So you'll be able to place yourself in authority under that because not all of them are good. We're told that there's many wolves in the scriptures. We're told that many wolves are behind the pulpits acting like they're shepherds. And they speak like sheep. But inside their hearts are ravenous wolves. And they've come in to fleece the flock instead of to bless the flock. And that's one thing that would keep me, want to keep me from leaving here ever as your pastor. Because who are you going to get to leave you? There ain't too many out there. There's not too many places to go that are already established. we got to lead you somewhere that I'm ever called away from this place. There's somebody out there. There's not somebody who needs to rise up in these ranks and take leadership. They need a good godly leader around here always. Be that. Rise up. Define your place. Understand your calling. That's what we talked about in the gifts. Know your gifts. Know your calling. Know your election. Are you a diakonos? We're all diakonos. We're all servants. The God of heaven, the King of kings was a servant. We follow his leadership. His leadership is by serving that is a true leader. A true leader is not one that served me, served me. Even Jesus came not to be ministered unto, to be served. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I'm going to wash your feet. I'm going to feed your hungry self. I'm going to look after your soul. I'm going to take care of you. This is the heart of Jesus, and this is the heart of Jesus' true people. And not everybody who calls himself a pastor is this. And he says, I'm writing to the elders which are among you. I'm exhorting you. I'm encouraging you. I, I want to lift you up and I want to tell you what being a pastor is. What is a true pastor? And this is good for diakonoses, servants, deacons, parishioners, the other sheep in the church to know what a good pastor is when you look at one. And what one isn't when you look at one. So God gives us these things. He also gives us the qualifications of pastor in, T in Timothy in those passages. Okay, The pastoral epistles. What is a good pastor? What is not a good pastor? What qualifies? You must be a man of integrity. 
He must be a person that's holy. He must live uprightly. He must have the heart of God and the heart of people in his mind at all times. He must continually give himself in sacrifice for the sheep. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd. He's the chief shepherd we'll see in this passage. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We see that. The great shepherd is raised from the dead by God to live. The great shepherd lives for the sheep. And we'll see the chief shepherd who's going to come for the sheep. He's going to come gather his home. And we're looking for Jesus. And when it's time to have a shepherd in your life, you need a good shepherd. You need a great shepherd. There's only one chief shepherd. And we always look unto him. We look beyond every shepherd unto him. Some people elevate themselves and they become the rock star of their church. Brother so-and-so. And people come to church for a personality. We come to church because that person is representing the Lord Jesus Christ, who's my chief shepherd. And when the chief shepherd appears, man, he's going to be coming and bringing rewards with him. And that's what I'm looking for. And I want to get together with my fellowshipping brothers and sisters. We've come together in obedience because we are commanded in Scripture, do not forsake assembling together as the manner of some is. It is vital that you obey God at every opportunity that you have to come together and meet with the sheep who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, you have a shepherd who cares for you and who wants the best for the sheep, who hates wolves. Your shepherd better hate wolves. You better hate wolves. You better recognize a wolf from a distance. Wolves howl. Sheep do not. Just listen to their voices after a while, you'll know. You'll be able to discern by hearing what they say and seeing how they live and how they act. It's all characteristics. Real shepherds have the DNA of the great shepherd, the good shepherd, and the chief shepherd. They act almost a lot like him. You can't tell the difference. They're not perfect. They're not extra holy. They're just guys who want the best for God and the best for God's people. And they want to bring them to God and cross the finish line together in holiness and righteousness and bring hundredfolders with them. A good shepherd doesn't want to cross the line first. Y'all help me get across the line first. A good shepherd wants to get across the line with all the sheep at the same time. We'll see some DNA here, what a good shepherd is. He's writing to the elders, and he says, I among you I encourage, who I'm also a shepherd, Peter says. I'm an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. I have witnessed. That means he's an apostle, a martyr. Do you know what a, a, a martyr is somebody who, we're all martyrs. We should all be martyrs. A martyr is not necessarily somebody who dies for the cause of Christ. It's somebody who witnesses for the cause of Christ. That's what a martyr is. I, I witnessed what I saw in Scripture. I witnessed to you what I saw firsthand by faith in the Scriptures. Peter saw it firsthand. He saw Jesus hanging on the cross and fled. Peter was there. He said, I'm an elder. I'm a pastor. I was there. I saw it. And so were we by faith. Hey, do you, do you believe everything that we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Do you believe that? Do you believe everything Paul wrote about his death, burial, and resurrection? Then you are to present that in truth as a witness. You're a martyr. Find your place there. Are you diakonos? Are you an elder? Are you a bishop, an overseer? Are you one who's willing to follow a godly shepherd because you're following the over-shepherd and you know his man, you've seen his under-shepherd come along? And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, he said, I saw it all, I witnessed it all. You and I witnessed it all through faith. If the Bible says it, I believe it. That's where we go with this thing. And guys, the book of Revelation is always, always, always factual and real until it says it's not. Don't ever allegorize the book of Revelation and say everything is typical or it's a type of something. No, it really is something. There are fireballs that are going to fall from the sky. Unless he says something differently, this is this like this or as this. He, the book of Revelation will tell you when it's metaphorical or when it's real. And if it doesn't say it's metaphorical, dude, it is real. It's the real deal. And so we read the word. We understand the word. We hide the word. And he says, the elders which are among you, I encourage, who I'm also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm also a partaker of that glory that shall be revealed Guys, here's the deal. You and I have been studying for the last four chapters the importance of Christian suffering. If you're truly a Christian, if you're truly serving the Lord, then what's going to happen to the body will be the same thing that has happened to our head. You will find yourself suffering. 
You will find yourself being persecuted. You will find yourself being tormented. And it will be by the dearest people to you. Satan will get into their minds. Why did Satan wait for Adam to be gone? Because he needed the weaker wife to get the, the lie into her head so it would incubate. And that's why Jesus said she's of the weaker vessel. That's why later in the New Testament we are told, wives, keep your mouth shut in church. Because you're not always going to speak the right thing. You might have stupid stuff in your head because you are the weaker vessel. If you got something to say, say it to your husband at home. That's some hardcore preaching. But it goes way back to the Garden of Eden and the truth and the way God created us. We got to go with God on this thing and believe and live as He has said and taught. I'm in the middle of a situation right now because men have decided something and a wife at home decided something differently after the decision was made. And now there's turmoil in the church through this. And they went about a whole different route than what God says to do in His Bible. You got a problem with a brother, you go to that brother one on one and take care of business. You don't stir up trouble in the mix. You don't become a wolf in the middle of the lambs. We better do things biblically. We better do things by the scriptures. And you better, wives, you keep silence. And you speak to your husbands at home. And if you're, if you're more spiritual than your husband, you still do this. Because the Bible says to do this. And it's time to do this. It's time to find your place. It's time to rise up. It's time to be in, in obedience. And it's time to recognize what an elder is, what a diakonos is, what a husband is, what a wife is. Guys, the whole uprising right now is women rebellion, women overtaking, William, women not being submissive, and the whole premise of Scripture is submit, submit, submit. The men submitting to God. The wives submitting to their husbands. It's submission, 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 and rebellion doesn't want to do that at all. I don't want to submit to my boss. I don't want to submit to his boss. I don't want to submit to nobody. And the Scripture says, no, you're going to submit to everybody. We're going to submit one to another in the fear of the Lord here in the family of God. We're going to bring ourselves under everybody. There's no bosses here. Even the pastor ain't a boss. He is a fellow sheep who happens to be the lead sheep. That's all that is. No employees, employers. We are all one in Christ Jesus, and we are all submitting to the greatest one who's ever submitted himself even to the point of death. God is a submitter who submitted himself, and you and I, his followers, are in submission, and we find ourselves in order of that submission, and we willingly take our places there. If you're going to rise up against your pastor, you better go find another church. Don't you rise up against your pastor. If your pastor's wrong, confront him one-on-one. -on -one, get it right. But if he's right, don't you dare cause a rebellion there. Korah. God will open up the world and swallow you and your kids into it. You better know your place. You better find your place. You better find peace in that place and find your existence there in humble adoration to God and finding the authority that he's placed in your life and submit yourself willingly under that authority. I, Peter, am writing to you as an example of Christ's sufferings. And I wasn't there for him when I needed to be, but I'm here now as a martyr. I'm willing to die. And we know that Peter became a martyr physically for Jesus Christ. And tradition tells us that he died upside down on a cross next to his wife. His wife believed unto death. His wife followed the elders which are among you I exhort, I'm also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ Jesus, and I'm a partaker of the glory that should be revealed. If you are walking in God, and if you are walking in submission, and you've left Wonder Woman behind, and you've left Bruce Jenner behind, guys, I saw a video of the Boy Scouts in the Philippines and they got the little boys doing girly dances with each other. The two little boys doing girly dances with each other. What has happened to the Boy Scouts of America? What has happened to the Boy Scouts that it's been westernized all over the world? We are doing this to 10 year old boys. We have gotten so far away from God and the pastors aren't preaching. This is the problem. And this is why we have Peter coming to us and saying, this is what an elder is supposed to do. A bishop, a good shepherd, a great shepherd, one who's following the chief shepherd. This is how he will lead his sheep. And he always takes the path through suffering because we're going to take the path of obedience. 
Obedience will lead you to suffering, and suffering, while we're there, we always know it's going to bring glory to God. God is tickled at our suffering when we suffer in his will. When we suffer for his cause, blessed are ye. When men shall revile you and persecute you and say things against you falsely, all manner of things against you falsely, you're in good company. They did that to Jesus and they're doing it to us, his martyrs. And we follow along and Peter says, if you are doing it right, there will be suffering. If you're following your pastor, he's suffering. And if you're following your pastor, you're going to go through suffering. And if you guys are walking with Jesus together, you will also share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The depth of your, the pressure that you face, the depth of your suffering, the depth of your persecution declares the eternal. What your suffering is temporary. The glorification is eternal. God wants us being a hundred folders with everything we got. Don't you dare live an existence here as a 30 folder, a one thirder, a two thirder. You give yourself wholly unto the Lord. You be willing to suffer wholly. And the glory that is ahead is eternal compared to this little 70 years that we suffer. Look unto it. Rejoice in it. Thank God for it. Believe it by faith because he's saying it right here in holy writ. Which was always settled in heaven. And Jesus is the writ in human form, in personage, a God form, made flesh, the word made flesh. It was in heaven. This verse was in heaven before it got down here and he gave it to Peter. And God wrote it to Peter, gave it to Peter to write in his own vernacular, his own experience, where God wrote it in heaven and says, I was also a partaker in his suffering. He gave it to Peter and said, you're going to like this part. Read it. I was also a partaker in the suffering. So like, that was settled in heaven. You wrote that a long time ago and now you got me right now. That's awesome. And God included him in the writing. And that's why it's important for us to know the writers. That's why it's important for us to include them in our reading. That's why it's important for us to know these people. Because God chose them, 40 people out of billions, to write to get his word here to us. And Peter's writing this and he's writing about the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you follow the chief shepherd, you're going to follow him straight through persecution. And while you're going through that persecution, you've got to learn to rejoice instead of get down to why me, Lord. You rejoice in the glory that shall be revealed, that's walking by faith. I know it's going to reveal the glory. I know it's going to be awesome. I know he's going to share that with me forever. I don't know what that looks like, but it's bigger than I know. It's awesome. I praise you for this, Lord. And we give it to him in faith, because without faith, you can't please him. And by faith, believing in this, I'm going to follow you, Chief Shepherd. You suffered, I'm going to suffer. When I suffer, I know that you are not. For the last 2,000 years, Jesus Christ has been basking in the glory. Don't you know that's your, your next stop? As the head, so is the body. That is your next stop. Will you live it by faith and rejoice in your suffering for the revealing of the great glory that is headed your way? Verse 2. Pastors, it is vital that you feed the flock of God. Why do we do expository preaching in here? So we'll cover every verse of the Bible. We'll cover every word of the Bible. We'll cover every letter of the Bible, every yod and every tittle, so you will have been fed and fed properly. You will have a regular diet, not just all candy bars. You will have a healthy diet. That's what the Word of God does, and a good pastor will lead you through the shepherd of the Scriptures, of the Word, the food. Isn't this the bread of heaven? Isn't this the water of life? Isn't this your sustenance? Isn't this your manna? Your holy manna from God is the word. You've got to have it more than your necessary food, Job. Yes. And a good pastor will always keep that in front of you. A good pastor will lead you to water. He will lead you to food. He will lead you to a proper balance in that food. And you'll go where there's plenty of green pasture. The good shepherd makes us to lie down in green pastures because we've already fed there. Now it's time to rest and chew our cud there. Beside the still water. Where there's water, there's pasture. Where there's pasture, there's water. That's where the shepherd drops us off. And he doesn't just leave us. He gets to sit down and watch us enjoy ourselves too. And the pleasure in the, in the middle of all his blessing. And his blessing is found in the word of God. And good shepherds will lead you and feed you through the word of God. And feed the flock of God which is among you. That's everywhere we go. And to your workplace, the Christians, through the flock of God. Don't change the subject. We want to get to work and change the subject. Churches today are talking, when everybody met together in their foyer, they're talking about sports and hunting and fishing and racing and everything else other than Jesus Christ and feeding the flock. 
They're talking about every other temporary blessing than the permanent one that's going to be revealed in the great revealing because I suffered yesterday. I didn't have a ball yesterday. God doesn't mind us having a ball. We just talked about that laying down in green pastures next to still water. God wants me resting, but he wants me resting in him at his leadership and his feedership. True leaders will lead you to the feeder. And God wants us eating well, and you better do it. learn to do that on your own. You think a sheep just stops eating when he doesn't see the shepherd around? I'm going to stop eating. My shepherd ain't here. People want to do that in church. People just don't read their Bible because they ain't in church. And the less they make it to church, the less Bible they get. God wants you feeding. He wants to be your over-shepherd. He wants to be your chief shepherd. You follow him continually. When you have the pastor in your sights, you're out of your sights. And you read that Bible and you feed and you heed and you feed and you heed and you do what he's leading you to do. Feed the flock of God, preachers. That's important. That's not happening today in America. The preachers are feeding their fat cells with physical food. Getting fat and sassy and going to all the great restaurants and having their little meetings and having their little get-togethers and it has nothing to do with the things of God and suffering and persecution for the glory that's set ahead of us. So get fat and sassy in America. And God is livid with the pastors in America. And when you read Isaiah and you read Jeremiah, he's livid at the pastors. He's mad he's going to get them first. He says, I'm going to destroy them, and then I will send you pastors that are after my heart. That's what he wants to do. Appreciate the pastors that God's given you that are after his heart. And the ones that are after his heart want to lead you where he's leading you, beside the still water and the pasture lands of God's word. And they will feed you every word of God, even the words that affect the pastor that he's got to change. That affects his emotions, that affects his past, that affects his future, that affects his present. And he'll still preach those truths because that's the next five verses that they come through. And they lead you through the, his own persecution and through his own troubles and through his trials. And we all get to eat. We all get to eat our cud and lie down next to the still water. That's where a good pastor will lead you. And Peter told us that's what a good pastor is. And he's encouraging us. He's exhorting the pastors. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight there of pastors, it's time to lead. Sheep, it's time to let your pastors do the leading. The Southern Baptist Church don't do that. They have committees that do all that. We don't like what a pastor said. We're going, we got a committee. Let's vote. You better learn to trust your pastor. You better learn to go Bible on this. Find you a new church. Find you a new pastor. If you don't like your pastor, find a new one. But you better do it God's way. The pastor is given the job by God, in God's word, to be the overseer. Now, He's not the overlord. He's the overseer. He's just one of the sheep who God's called to lead. He's the lead sheep. He's one of us. He's one of the boys. He's one of the girls. He's, he's just one of us. He's a fellow sufferer. He's a fellow laborer. He's going through his persecution if he's doing it right. He's feeding himself and he's feeding the others if he's doing it right. He's producing lambs. What's the key thing to a shepherd? A shepherd wants all of his sheep doing well because they're going to provide for him. He doesn't have to kill them. He doesn't have to slaughter his sheep. He just has to see that they're eating well and they are reproducing and having little baby lambs. And they are producing wool, clothing, income. They're taking care of him. He just sees after them and they see after him. Because it's vital in these days, just before Peter was writing this, up until the time Jesus died and rose from the dead, it was important that sheep were producing little lambs because you had to take the perfect one down to the temple. And you wanted to take care of your sheep and you wanted these precious little lambs coming into the world because they had a special mission that God the Father was pleased in and he had commanded in the Old Testament pointing to the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ. And when he came here and he poured out himself on the cross and he died and was the final slaughtered sacrifice, we now look unto him as the completer, the finisher of our faith, the beginner, the finisher, everything. And we always think of his being the perfect lamb, his being the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd the great overseer. And your pastor has been given the job to oversee things for God's sake, for the people's sake, for your good. Let it happen, especially if you're walking in the word. Find you a pastor. If you don't have one, folks, if you don't have a pastor where you are, find one and walk in the word. 
One who's walking in the word, one who loves God, one who loves people. One who's a fellow sheep himself, and he doesn't think himself more highly than he ought to think. He looks every man also on the things of others and not on his own needs, his own self. Find that kind of a guy, because it's biblical. That's the kind of passage we need. Taking oversight, not by constraint, being forced, laziness. I'm, I'm, I'm now the pastor, so I'm going to sit here and play golf all week long. I'm going to hang out, go to the movies, just hang out with people, have my buffet dinners, go to lunch every day, have meetings, sit up in my room, watch some Netflix up there in my office. And then on Saturday, I'll watch a couple videos of the passage I might preach tomorrow and just do some plagiarizing. That's what a lot of pastors do. And they do it by constraint, through pure laziness, from having, to, I got to do it. These people are expecting me to preach a sermon tomorrow, so I'll come up with some. That's what they're paying me for. So I'll just, I'll come up with some. We're commanded the pastor should not do that. The pastor should not do it by constraint, but willingly. I love it. I love bringing the Word. I like reading the Word. I like studying the Word. I want to bring it to you willingly. I want to share with you what God has shared with me. I want you to have the same blessing that He blessed me with. I want you eating the same grub that I just ate and drink from the same pond I just drank from. I want you laying down my still waters because the chief shepherd's leading both of us through this. Are you ready to watch these next five verses? Let's do this! You find some guy who's excited about the Bible, who's excited about the Word, who loves it passionately and not, i got to show up this way because they're paying me for this. Now, the Bible does command you to pay your pastor. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and 1 Timothy chapter 5, you're supposed to feed the pastors to free them up from what it is they're doing, to free them up to do what they're supposed to be doing so they can lead willingly and not. You guys are great. You guys, this message is not to this crowd here today. This message is to you. You guys are good. You guys take care of your pastor. You guys walk. You guys talk. You guys listen. You guys obey. You guys know the leadership. God has taught you well here, and you follow well. And I praise God for you, and I commend you. As we are commending the elders, I commend you the sheep. Praise God for you. You take care of your sheep, your shepherd, like the Bible commands you. 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Timothy 5. You're supposed to take care of them. The goal is to get them full-time. That's the goal. That's why we grow. That's why we go produce little sheep. That's why we soul win. That's why we give. That's why you give 10%. That's a starting point. We shared that in Bible study the other night. It's just a starting point. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. You know, if everybody in, who says they're part of our Bible study, they don't attend anywhere else, if they were a part of our Bible study, if they started at the 10% percentile, we'd be having a whole lot different setup here. Do you understand that? It's important for you to do your part, sheep. The shepherd's taking care of the sheep. The sheep need to take care of the shepherds. Amen? That's God's plan. You guys do it well here. And I encourage you guys to do it there. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof, not by laziness, no, I got to do it, but by willingness. I love doing this. I love my sheep. I want to, guys, I want to present you to God, holy and righteous and full-blown 100 folders. That's what I want out of you. That's why I get up here and harp and scream and holler and shout and say, I hate the devil and we fight off the wolves on your behalf. And we want you finishing well and finishing strong and finishing obedient. That's our heart. That's our joy. We do that willingly. Not for filthy lucre. Not for covetousness. Oh, I gotta, I'm, I'm out looking for a new gig because I'll, I'll get more money out of it, more prestige. That's what a lot of pastors do. They taught us to do that in seminary. You'll start out, you'll get a volunteer gig, a part-time gig. Then you'll get a full-time gig as a youth pastor. Then you step up from associate pastor and you become a full-blown pastor in a small church until you take a bigger church. Because that's how people think in the church. They think just like a stupid business. And they'll hire some guy that's been at it for 25 years over some young fired up fireball who loves God with all his heart, who knows the scriptures, who's in love with Jesus. Daniel, would you hire Daniel as a 12-year-old kid to be your pastor? No, because he didn't go to seminary. Retard. But you'll hire some guy that's been to seminary and doesn't know God and doesn't care about nobody but himself. He's covetous. All he wants is money. All he wants for his fat self. He wants a better hot suit. He wants to be on the TV screen. He wants to be noticed in town. He wants the best seats at the restaurant. He wants to be served well. He wants to serve his fat self. And you'll hire him because he has a doctorate. Jesus Christ called you unto holiness, unto righteousness. I need somebody to lead me who's leading me straight to Jesus, man. Lead me through the pastures. 
of God's word who's leading me straight through persecution. Helping me out on the other side when I'm going through spiritual warfare. He's right by my side. That's who I want. That's who I want, guys. I got you. I thank God for you guys. Help me through when I'm going through my hard time. You're right there for me, and I bless God for you, man. That's the kind of preacher we want to. Not for filthy lucre. That is covetousness. That's dirty money. Here's a, all money's dirty until you give it to the Lord. Render Caesar's things under Caesar's to God and things to God. You give that which is filthy and messed up, you give it to the Lord, and he'll clean it up every time. Ain't that great? Isn't that what you did with you? You gave him you, messed up, all nasty, garbagey you, and he did something great with it. Transformed it into a new creation. Old things passed away, old things have become new. He does that. He'll do that with our money, and he'll bless it. He'll bless it in the ministry. Every time he, we make here, after the pastor's been paid, we get it out there in the ministry. We get it out there to the orphans and the widows. Right now, they're, they're needing some supplies. We're going to fix them up. We, we had the privilege in the orphanage to buy 100 more Bibles and to help them winterize the building. Now the little babies have grown up and they're becoming young women and they need female products real bad because they don't have a good supply of them there in, the, in Pakistan. Our little girls are becoming young women. Our little sheep are becoming you sheep. Mommy-sized. And we need to take care of them so they can produce little ones who are not orphans. We take care of the orphans and the widows and we keep ourselves unspotted from the world. That's pure religion and undefiled before God the Father. And that's what we do. And that's what every ministry needs to be doing. Every, people want to pay money for stupid stuff and background droppings and, and the lights and the camera and the action and the buildings and millions on this. And meanwhile, the kids are starving to death. The little girls just need a simple little panties and some sanitary napkins. It's all they need. To make them live longer and healthier. That needs to happen. It needs to happen in America. It needs to happen everywhere. And God is sick of what's happened in America with the pastors leading the way. He's tired of it. We are to feed the flock of God. We're taking the oversight and do the right thing. Not by constraint because I'm forced to do this, but because I love doing it because God's called me to do it. Not for filthy money and not for covetousness, but of a ready mind and saying, God, what's next? People, what's next? Let's do this thing together. Verse 3. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. Pastors want to come in and, and be the dictator of their people. You find that guy, you get rid of him or you get gone. Pastors aren't dictators. Pa pastors are sheep. They're servants. They themselves are diakonos who's been called to lead. We're servants. That's the kind of pastor you always want to follow. You want to follow somebody who's following the Lord, the great servant leader king. They're going to be examples. Examples. You want somebody who represents God, Jesus Christ, in front of you. That's who you want to lead you, man. And when you find that person, you follow. And you do. And you understand that they're the voice of God in the midst of this wicked generation. And you listen. And you heed. And you do. And you support. And you go on. And that man determines he's not going to be a dictator of these people. And he's not going to overlord these people. And he's not going to hurt these people. And he's not going to force more out of them than they got. He's going to trust God with them, know what their gifts are, and let them utilize their gifts, what God's given them, for the kingdom of God, and not wear out the saints. That's the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us into comfort. It's the Antichrist's job to wear out the saints. You read Daniel? Satan's job wears out the saints. And pastors behind the pulpits want to wear out their saints. Do this more. I need more of you. More of you this. Yeah. Guys, Jehovah's Witness meet five times a week. That's wearing out the sinners. Them folks are sinners trying to please God by all this work they do. God's called us under rest. He's called you to do your job, know your job, and find you a pastor who understands that. Who's not a lord, who's not the boss, who's not a dictator. He's just one of you who follows the Lord and is tender to the Lord, knowing that he's going to have to give an account for everything he's done with the sheep. Lord, I did this for you. I tried every best way I could for you. I tried to protect them from the wolves. I tried to preach your truth, Lord. That's how your pastor needs to present you to God. You need to find that kind of guy. They're out there. They're very, very rare, but they're out there. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but examples. Examples of the kingdom of God, examples of blessing, examples of suffering, examples of persecution, examples of somebody who can rejoice in these things and not complain and quit. 
who can overcome. The Lord's looking for somebody who will overcome survivors, man. Overcoming with patience, with endurance. God loves that. Find you a guy like that and follow. You, you find some guy that's willing to die doing that and you die trying to help. That's what this thing's about. Working together in the kingdom of heaven against the devil, against the wolves, against religion, all the religious crowd in your city. Get rid of that. And you follow godly people. You hang with godly people. You help feed the sheep. Be an example yourself to the little ones. We're all elders, folks. Parents, you got little sheep. Grandkids, kids. People around you, neighborhood kids. Be examples. Be good shepherds. Be good elders. Neither is being lords and dictators over God's people, his heritage. Guys, you are God's inheritance. And you know what's so cool? He said, I'll be your inheritance. God is our inheritance. And he ain't good enough for the church. They want more stuff. They want lights, glitz, camera, action, smoke. We need a dance team. We need all this other stuff to get us jacked up on Sunday. So when I leave, I won't think no more about God, my inheritance. When you come to the understanding that God is your inheritance, that's the best thing in the world. And he's given you all of himself. He's already given you his inheritance up front. You don't even have to be a prodigal with that. He's blessed you. He's blessed you. He's blessed you. We're his heritage and he's ours. What a blessing, man. Verse 4. When the chief shepherd is going to appear at the rapture, he's going to give you a crown of glory that won't ever fade away for having done all this. He's talking to the leaders. He's talking to the shepherds. The, you know, the five crowns, this is one of them. Every one of us is an elder in some light. You may not be the, the elder of a church body, but you're the elder of a Sunday school class, the elder of uh, your family, the elder at work. You might be a boss at work. You might have people under you at work. You're always some kind of elder, some kind of leader. Be an example of the flock, and you represent Jesus, and don't be afraid to talk about him. He's your heritage, man, and you are his, and you talk about him knowing that you're not going to miss out on your crown that fadeth not away. Guys, there's going to be bigger crowns for 100 folders than there will be for 30 folders. I don't know what that looks like, but it's eternal. I don't know what that looks like, but it's eternal. Everybody will be satisfied in, in who they are and what God has given us because of what we've done on this side, what we've planted and sown and reaped. We're all going to be joyful in heaven, but there's going to be a joyful 30-folder and there's going to be a joyful 100-folder. And I encourage you to be a joyful 100-folder. You give everything you got, every breath, everything you got to the Lord Jesus Christ day and night, and you be an example to everybody around you in that don't you Dare be afraid to talk about Jesus, man. You are stupid and you have no faith that this is you. I encourage you as your pastor leader, change, repent. Today decide, Lord, I'm sick of being a wuss. I'm sick of being a pansy. I'm sick of not being a person of faith who recognizes the fact that I'll die soon and I'll be facing you. Will you please develop in me Faith that sees that truth that I'm going to face you. And when I face you, I want to come with a heritage of blessing. I want to be able to give you a bunch of stuff, God. Today's church and all the pastors give me a bunch of stuff, God. Oh, give, give, give. That's what all these preachers on TV and preach. You give to our ministry and oh, Lord, I bless you. What they're saying is fill my pockets up and make me feel fat and sassy, folk. And they ain't going to have nothing. I don't even, I don't believe they're going to heaven. I don't believe they're real shepherds of the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ of the Bible. Because the real shepherds are doing what this guy said. And this guy said all of this while his people were being burned alive at Nero's court. While they were being pulled apart. While they were being sawn asunder. While they were being persecuted. He's telling the people this. It's coming your way, America. You might as well figure out what a good pastor looks like before that happens. <gasps> You might as well figure out what a good sheep, you look in the mirror, find out what a good sheep is. Lord, I want to be a good sheep of your pasture. You're the great shepherd, you're a good shepherd, you're the chief shepherd. And when you appear, I want to have that glorious crown that will fade not away because I followed you through suffering and I rejoiced while I was there looking unto the glory that was going to follow. My temporary suffering, the great trade-off for the eternal glorious crown that 
fadeth not away. That my chief shepherd, because I followed you, because you were so good at your death, you were so great at your resurrection, and you were such an awesome leader. You only led us in righteousness. You're awesome, Lord. And you praise him for that today. You praise him that way today, this evening, tomorrow, every day that you live. You be a good example to the flock that's around you, whether they're in this little group or they're not. When you go to different places, when you're at your work and they go to different churches, be an example to the flock, to the Christians, of what a good Christian looks like because you're following the chief shepherd. And you look like him to them. When you do that, he's going to show up and always, always, always know that you're going to see him in the face. And he's got a crown for you. And you expect it because he said so. He is not going to tell you there's something that exists that he's not going to give you. Oh, whoops, I forgot your crown. You live every day expecting I'm going to get that crown from the chief shepherd. I'm going to live for him. And if that takes me via persecution, let's do this, Lord. You do it with a rejoicing, excited heart. And you be an example to all the flock, whether they're part of this little body or somebody else's. You be a good shepherd under the under shepherd or the over shepherd. You be a good under shepherd under the over shepherd and let him lead. And you look unto Jesus. He's going to reward you. He's going to reward you well. You be faithful. You follow when you're supposed to follow and you lead when you're supposed to lead and never get out of that. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who's going to reward you in your faithfulness because you found your place, you found your calling, you know your gifts, you're making your calling and your election sure. You are following him in that. You're faithful to him. They're his gifts. They're his glory. You're his heritage. He's yours. You're following him is who you're following and you know that he is going to be the one who presents you a crown that fadeth not away because of your loyal, faithful service to him. And you led, and you led properly, and you didn't backstep, and you didn't backslide, and you weren't shameful, and you weren't embarrassed. You did it faithfully. You weren't a jerk. You just were faithful. And he said, I'm going to give everybody who leads well this crown of righteousness, this crown of glory that fades not away. Please, if you're in this group, do not, do not miss out on that crown. You be a good follower. And when you're called upon, you be a good leader. And you be a good example everywhere you go, every minute of that day, to everybody around you from a pure heart. Not one who's lazy and not willing to do it. You do it willingly. You do it with a good attitude. You don't do it for money or recognition. You do it because God's watching and you want to please him at all times. And you know the entire time that your faithfulness will bring you to a place to meet him in the face one day. And he'll look at you and say, good, well done now, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. You're going to love this. You are going to love this. You ready? He's going to offer you the crowns. He's going to give you his gifts. He's going to give you all that was his. It's all his, and he wants us to be the possessors of what's his for eternity. Joint heirs with Christ. Everything that Jesus deserves for himself. I don't want none of it. That's yours. He's going to give it to his faithful. Be his faithful. Be his faithful lamb. Be his faithful sheep. Produce other sheep. Look after the sheep. Listen to the voice of the shepherds. Listen to the voice of God, the under-shepherd and the over-shepherd. Look to Jesus as the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the overcoming, awesome chief shepherd. Know that he's going to bless you. He's going to bless you big. Be ready. It might be tonight. Rejoice. Be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Let's pray.